There are three reasons why Dr. Stone is a must-read manga. Unique story progression, consistently amazing art, and a family of characters you just have to invest in. It's one of the biggest manga in Shonen Jump, so obviously there's fans. But aside from the occasional teching video, conversations about Dr. Stone seem to be overshadowed by other series like One Piece and My Hero Academia. That's why in this discussion, I'm going to explain why the story progression, art, and characters make Dr. Stone a manga that you really need to read every week. Be warned that this video contains spoilers for season 1 of the anime, with minor manga spoilers at the very end. Before I get started, make sure to comment with your thoughts on Dr. Stone. I'll pick my favorite and share it as comment of the week in the next discussion. This week's comment comes from Ronald Tran, who said you need both power and resolve in One Piece. If you'd like more discussions on Dr. Stone or other series like One Piece, then make sure to subscribe so you can follow along with each week's video. With that out of the way, let's discuss why Dr. Stone's unique story progression gives it near-perfect pacing. Now, what's the big appeal of the series? Science. And generally speaking, scientific endeavors are usually very, very slow. Think about it, it's been months since the quarantine began and we still don't have vaccines. This is because science often takes a very long time with almost nothing to show for it. So you would think in a manga that relies so much on science, the story's pacing would be similarly slow. But Dr. Stone actually has great pacing. This is because of the way it uses goals and roadmaps. Every arc in Dr. Stone begins with a very specific end goal along with a roadmap for reaching that goal. By presenting these end goals, readers are given concrete reasons to invest in each arc. And by building towards those goals with maps and steps, readers can actually see what needs to happen. Let's use the Ishigami Village Saga as an example. Beginning with the Kingdom of Science arc, Senku needs to ally himself with the village so he can stop Tsukasa's empire. He's denied entry into the village but learns that the chief's daughter, Ruri, is sick. This is when Senku sets out to gain the village's trust by making a cure for Ruri. Then, to set the stage for the arc, Senku lists each ingredient they need to make the drug for Ruri. And this is exactly how the story progresses. At no point does the story veer away from this roadmap. Wait, why are we looking for iron? Oh right, we need electricity. So why are we doing a tournament now? Oh, I get it, we need the alcohol to make the drug. As you can see, these goals and steps set a trajectory so that each chapter moves the characters closer and closer to achieving their goal. But you might be thinking, wait, if I know where the story is headed, doesn't it just become predictable? You would think that with a manga that basically spells out the plot for you, the story would quickly get boring. But the plot always stays interesting because each step is unique and substantially impacts the characters. For the sake of contrast, let's briefly look at the formula used in JoJo's Part 3. The Stardust Crusaders need to beat Dio and they also need to beat his minions along the way. Like Dr. Stone, you know the end goal and are told how the team will get there. But where does Part 3 go wrong? The story follows its formula without changing much along the way. Dio's minion appears, a certain character eventually figures out the weakness of their stand, and then they win before moving on to the next stand user. For the most part, the plot moves forward just like this with fights that become so monotonous that you just want to skip to Dio's fight. Unlike Part 3, Dr. Stone stays interesting because each step is unique and makes a substantial impact. Each objective might follow a similar formula, but none of them play out exactly the same. For electricity, Senku has to make a magnet using lightning so he can later build a generator. For sulfuric acid, he has to build gas masks so that the scary lady can't eat his soul. Or something like that. For cell phones, Senku has to explore a dungeon for tungsten so he can build proper vacuum tube filaments. With each step, the characters apply a certain scientific principle, then a completely different obstacle is presented, and they apply new technology and principles to reach the next step. Better yet, each of the steps makes a long-term impact. An obvious example is the hydroelectric plant, which gives them all the energy they could ever need. But a better example is the cell phone. Not only does it give them an advantage in the battle against Tsukasa, but it also becomes their primary means of communication in every arc going forward, especially as they begin traveling to faraway places. This is why the story progression in Dr. Stone is so great. Each arc begins with a goal that offers clear reasons to be invested, each step towards the goal is unique from the last, and those steps always make substantial impacts on the story and its 
its characters. Speaking of characters, let's transition to why they make Dr. Stone so enjoyable. Everyone loves characters, right? Even when a story's plot is less than stellar, readers stick with that story if they can make emotional investments in the characters. And since Dr. Stone uses technology rather than power levels to move the plot, characters are given real development rather than just getting new transformations or abilities. Now, admittedly, a large share of the characters are basically one-dimensional when we meet them. Kaseki might as well be a dwarf, and Magma is basically a cut and paste of Gaston. Then of course, there's Suika. When we first meet Suika, she might as well be screaming, I'm the mascot, and that's her bit for a decent portion of time. Be cute, hop around in her little melon, and lighten the mood. Even her motivation to be of use to others isn't very profound at first. But then we learn Suika is basically blind and wishes she could see properly. This simple mascot is suddenly given a very real problem, so we begin to take an interest in her struggle with that problem. Now, Suika doesn't suddenly become a deeply profound character, but this problem is so relatable that it allows readers to really connect with her. From this point, we take an interest in seeing Suika finally fix her sight problem. Coincidentally, this is when the other characters do the same. Suika had always felt like something was wrong with her, and that she had to make herself useful to compensate for this weakness. Senku realizes why Suika wears her melon and decides at that moment to help fix the problem, so he and the others work together to make her glasses. Notice, Senku prioritizes making glasses before making flasks for the lab. Then, when Senku gives Suika her new glasses, she realizes there was nothing ever really wrong with her in the first place, and that she's okay just how she is. As you can see, the characters work together to solve their problems. They recognize that they all have faults and go out of their way to help each other out. And this is true for the whole cast. Kinro's problem becomes Suika's problem. Kohaku's concern for her sister becomes Senku's concern. Senku's desire to help everyone becomes Chrome's desire. The characters are all given very real problems like loneliness and fear, so readers invest in the struggle to overcome those problems we know all too well. At the same time, other characters invest in those same problems, and they grow together by covering for the weaknesses of their friends. And this is why the characters make reading Dr. Stone so enjoyable. Readers become invested in the everyday struggles of individual characters, and they invest in the family that the characters build by working to help each other. And while I could talk about these characters for hours on end, it would be criminal if I didn't discuss the amazing art. Now don't get me wrong, the art is freaking gorgeous, but the true beauty is how versatile it is. Boichi, Dr. Stone's artist, consistently delivers panels that effectively convey their intended message. The obvious example would be the comedic scenes. Everyone who watches the anime knows that Dr. Stone is absolutely hilarious, and this is just as true for the manga. For example, after building a car, the team realizes they need to add some armor plating. Senku decides paper is the best choice for armor, so he has everyone work together to make some. And then we get this. Gen and Senku already know the value of paper, and Kaseki can see it right away because of his experience as a craftsman. But, as you can see, the paper's value is completely lost on the fighters, who just sit there like cavemen and, well, pick their boogers. And without major spoilers, there are plenty more times where Dr. Stone makes readers laugh by correcting the assumptions of its characters. But as funny as it is, Boichi also has the ability to impact readers with an intricate level of detail. One of my favorite panels is this one right here. During a flashback, we're reminded of how humanity's lust for power reduced it to tribalism. This character wanted to put an end to the fighting, but obviously that didn't turn out so well. In a blind fury, he slashes everything around him, as shown by the blank eyes and the many spots of blood. And as you read Dr. Stone, you'll come to learn that this kind of insanely detailed art is commonplace. In short, this is why you have to read this manga. On top of the unique story progression and relatable characters, the art has an amazing capacity for both simple laughs and deep emotional impact. And that's it for this discussion. As you can see, the Dr. Stone manga lends itself to all kinds of great discussion. If you enjoyed this discussion, then make sure to like the video. If you'd like more Dr. Stone discussions like this one, then make sure to subscribe to the channel for weekly videos. Thank you for watching, and I hope to hear from you soon.